And let's go to John Holloman now, who's got more on some other things that cannot be taken for granted. John? You know, Bernie, for the past 32 months, the people in NASA and all the contractors who work on the space shuttle for NASA in the Congress, in the uh, Reagan administration, and in the public have been thinking about the pictures that they saw live on CNN from the very place where I am standing 32 months uh, ago. And um, after looking and compiling all the lessons that different people had learned, we have come up with sort of a synopsis of the, the many, many lessons of Challenger. The Challenger would have flown successfully if the weather at Cape Canaveral had been warm. The morning of January 28, 1986 was icy cold here. So when the Challenger's solid rockets ignited, cold stiffened putty in the right lower field joint simply gave way, sending hot rocket exhaust gases into the joint. The 6,000 degree gases found no resistance at a cold primary O-ring, and because the rocket was bulging from pressure, the second O-ring was not sealed either. And again, the hot gas blasted to the outside. Two and a half seconds later, the shuttle continued to rise, and the deadly booster fault was sealed temporarily by burning aluminum oxide from the rocket exhaust. When Challenger passed through high winds at the point of maximum dynamic pressure, about a minute into the flight, that temporary seal was broken, and 6,000 degree flame burned through the lower half of the external tank where the liquid hydrogen was stored. Seconds later, the rocket nose struck the top of the huge tank, releasing liquid oxygen, which mixed with the hydrogen, causing the explosion and destroying the Challenger nearly nine miles above the Earth. Within a week of the accident, a presidential commission headed by former Secretary of State William Rogers was hard at work on Challenger, meeting with all the principals, attempting to raise the curtain that surrounded the space agency. It took the Rogers Commission six months just to find out what happened, and it uncovered what the commission called a more serious problem. NASA was not communicating with itself and was keeping some problems, such as the history of O-ring faults, secret from top management. In the 32 months since the accident, NASA and commission members say these problems have been dealt with. They've not only done all the things that we recommended, but they've gone beyond that and fixed the things that they themselves knew were wrong and which they continued to fly with even knowing that they were wrong. A team of rocket scientists from booster maker Morton Thiokol and the space agency spent years fixing the problems and remaking the boosters that are going to send Discovery into orbit. There have been hundreds of changes made in an effort to make the shuttle safer. More than 50 in the boosters, 200 in the orbiter, and scores in the main engines and other systems. We have uh, improved the reliability of the redesigned solid rocket motor significantly over the uh, solid rocket motor that flew on the Challenger to where it's a very safe and reliable motor. The other problem with people is harder to solve, but NASA is working on it. All the major figures who were involved in the decision to launch Challenger in the cold resigned, retired, or were replaced. New lines of communication have been opened to make sure anyone who suspects a problem with the shuttle can have that concern investigated and put to rest. The biggest change for the good is the openness. Uh, there were clearly, as a result of the Challenger accident, a lot of uh, mistakes made by a lot of people. Nobody was prepared for that. I think the communications are quite open now. Uh, and so everybody's up being ready to go do it. But everyone in NASA from top to bottom yeah, knows that human beings yeah. can and will make mistakes. <laughs> and someday in the future, there will be another shuttle accident. The space scientists say their job now is to guarantee that the time of the next accident is as far into the future as they can make it. John Holloman, CNN at the Kennedy Space Center. Let's listen in now to launch control for a moment. Red blood cells experiments. I presume we'll get a uh, update on availability. An isoelectric focusing experiment, uh, which is a technique for separating compounds by utilizing the differences in their electrical and chemical properties. Another is the protein crystal growth uh, experiment. This will be your camera. And the physical vapor transport of organic solids experiment. This is a 3M experiment. Uh, which is to obtain thick and highly ordered crystalline films on selected substrates. The countdown continuing on, uh, we're in the, uh, the process of completing the, uh, the cabin leak checks and uh, 
the venting of uh, the cabin pressure into the uh, the payload bay. Everything going satisfactory as we look for a liftoff at 11.30 a.m. this morning. This is shuttle launch control. Two billion dollars of American taxpayers' money was put into this orbiter that you're looking at. Safety improvements, improvements that were deemed necessary by not only NASA officials, but the Rogers Commission. And when we come back, we're going to talk intimately about some of the critical changes made. Now let's listen to the latest from Launch Control. An important poll is being conducted among the directors. Uh, to uh, verify that they are sure that the, we should continue on, and he will report his findings to the launch director. Since the Challenger accident, the shuttle Discovery and its systems have undergone close inspection and overhaul. Literally hundreds of changes have been made on the orbiter, the external fuel tank, the shuttle main engines, and the solid rocket boosters. Several of the more obvious changes involve safety, specifically in the area of getting the crew out of the shuttle in the event of an emergency. The Discovery is the first the shuttle to provide a way for the crew to bail out. If an emergency were declared where the spacecraft is gliding and could not get back to a runway after launch, the crew would leave through a side hatch. They would get an assist from a small rocket pack. This boost combined with a long telescoping pole is designed to push the crew members far enough out of the hatch to make sure they do not fall into the shuttle's wings. Once clear, they use these parachutes for descent and they will be carrying survival gear. If an emergency were to happen before launch, the astronauts and mission specialists have been given a new way to exit, exit the pad. Once out of the orbiter, they are supposed to hop into a couple bassets, which are suspended from a wire leading to the ground. Then they just slide down this wire. A system of nets has been set up on the ground to slow and stop the baskets as they reach the bottom. An armored personnel carrier is left on standby to whisk the crew away from there. Perhaps the most important changes are those made to the solid rocket booster joints, which are blamed for the Challenger accident. The joint has been beefed up. An extra lip has been added to make it more sturdy, and an extra rubber O-ring is in place. On the outside, of that O-ring is in place to prevent the gases from escaping. On the outside of the joint, a new heating system has been added. It is designed to keep the joint temperature above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, no matter what the outside temperature. In addition, internal changes have been made with the intent of using the rocket's own thrust to provide a tighter seal at the joint. Joining us now with more on this very important change, Keith Henson, solid rocket seal expert. You have a model of the old and the new. Yes, Bernie, I do. Uh, this is a uh, model of just the, uh, the joint itself, which is a slice out of the cylinder of the overall solid rocket motor. The particular one that I'm holding here is one from the 51L, our Challenger launch. And as you can see, it, it included two O-rings, a simple Tang Clevis arrangement. These are the two O-rings there. Yes, only yeah. a slice of them. Uh, in their totality, they would go 360 degrees around the solid rocket motor case. Mm -hmm. Uh, the basic function of the joint, of course, is to contain the uh, chamber pressure due to combustion of the solid rocket motor from this side, preventing it to escape through the crack of the tang clevis joint to the outside. Now, Keith, before so the O-rings pressed in are uh, theoretically provided to accomplish that function. Could you show, just hold up the new well, okay. with the old before you continue, just so viewers can see what the two look alike, look like well, side by side? Uh, with respect to the tang clevis arrangement, the, the augmentation or the design enhancement is very simply the incorporation of a capture feature, as we call it. Okay, let's turn. Um, let's point that to the other camera. That's right. 
Now, could you hold them side by side, just so that viewers can make a comparison? Okay. And the new one is this one. The one on the one in my left hand is okay, the new that's one. That's the new one. With the capture feature, the one in my right hand is the old 51L design. Okay. The basic function, of course, of the capture feature is to prevent deflection, deflection of the tang versus the clevis when you go from zero pressure to like a thousand PSI inside the motor case at ignition, mm -hmm. which obviously would cause a deflection in the system and give the O-ring mating surfaces to the structure the opportunity to deflect. The presence of the capture feature locks things in place and prevents that kind of thing.